to our viewers in North America and around the globe. My name is Mike Embley. Our top stories. North Korean state media says Kim Jong-un's accepted an invitation to visit the United States and that Donald Trump's been invited to Pyongyang. At Tuesday's summit, North Korea claimed yet again it would get rid of its nuclear weapons, but the U.S. president shocked his allies in the region with this pledge on military exercises. We will be stopping the war games, which will save us a tremendous amount of money. The eyes to the right, 324. The nose to the left, 298. In the UK, the government avoids a damaging defeat over Brexit, but only just. And the French president criticizes the new Italian government for refusing to take in 600 migrants stranded on a rescue ship in the Mediterranean. Hello, it's been an extraordinary 24 hours and the world is still reacting to the Kim Trump summit. And it looks as if President Trump and Kim Jong-un will meet again. North Korea's official state news agency is reporting the two leaders have invited each other to their respective capitals and that both have accepted. But there are many questioning Donald Trump's upbeat assessment of the historic meeting. Our North America editor John Sopel watched events unfold in Singapore. His report does contain flash photography. It was carefully choreographed, dramatically staged, and yet now utterly unbelievable. Both men walking stiffly with nervous smiles. The handshake lasted 12 seconds. The president saying it was an honor to meet Kim Jong-un. Has North Korea ever been given a platform like this? Nine months ago, Donald Trump was calling him Little Rocket Man, and Little Rocket Man was calling him a mentally deranged dotard. Now they're walking together and sharing a laugh. I feel really great. We're going to have a great discussion, and I think tremendous success. They'll be tremendously successful. We will have a terrific relationship, I have no doubt. From Kim Jong-un, a rather different rhetorical style. It hadn't been easy to get here, he said. The past had acted as fetters on our limbs, and old prejudices worked as obstacles, but we overcame all of them. The pair met with just their translators initially, and were then joined by officials. The talks lasted most of the morning. Detractors have said this meeting would be nothing more than a glorified photo op. It's much more than that but there were enough pictures to fill an album. There was the balcony scene. Very good. The walk in the gardens. Very great. And the boys and their toys moment, when Chairman Kim wanted to see inside the beast, the president's famous limo. But then came the important moment, the signing of a document apparently committing North Korea to complete denuclearization, even if it was rather longer on intent than concrete steps to get there. Would you like to say something to the press? We had a historic meeting and decided to leave the past behind. The document contained four key points, agreeing to establish new relations, joining together to build a lasting and stable peace, working towards the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, and recovering the remains of prisoners of war. Seven billion people inhabit planet Earth. Before Donald Trump's news conference, the journalists were shown a propaganda-style video produced by the Americans, extolling the great denuclearized future ahead. Two men, two leaders, one destiny. But missing from it, and the agreement, were two key U.S. demands, that the process must be irreversible and verifiable, and that looked like a negotiating victory for the North Koreans. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And that was a repeated question for Donald Trump. The North Koreans had reneged on promises before, so why would this time be different? Well, you have a different administration. You have a different president. You have a different secretary of state. You have people that are, you know, it's very important to them, and we get it done. Another victory for the North Koreans seemed to be this declaration from the U.S. president, a pledge that took South Korea by surprise. We will be stopping the war games 
which will save us a tremendous amount of money unless and until we see that the future negotiation is not going along like it should. The president lavished praise on Kim Jong-un, but that brought this question. The man you met today, Kim Jong-un, as you know, has killed family members, has starved his own people. Why are you so comfortable calling him very talented? Well, he is very talented. Anybody that takes over a situation like he did at 26 years of age and is able to run it and run it tough. I don't say he was nice or I don't say anything about it. He ran it. Very few people at that age, you can take one out of 10,000 probably couldn't do it. From this remarkable meeting ground where the flags fly side by side, Donald Trump now sees a future where the U.S. and North Korea are working together. The word historic is often overused. Today it was justified. Extraordinary strides have been taken to get to this point. But it's what happens next that is really crucial. How do you ensure that North Korea keeps its word on denuclearization? To that question, Donald Trump said, well, you're going to have to trust me. Donald Trump is now on his way back to Washington, exhausted, but you also sense exhilarated by what's happened. John Sopel, BBC News, Singapore. We're going to be digging more into all this in just a moment. First, we need to bring you this breaking news. North Korea has claimed that President Trump agreed to lift sanctions on North Korea during that meeting. This is coming from the front page of the Workers' Daily, the mouthpiece of North Korea's ruling Communist Party. It shows the flags, the handshakes, as you'd expect, the smiles, the two men seemingly meeting on equal terms. And then the paper says... President Trump agreed to lift sanctions. This, of course, not something that was in the signed agreement. It appears to be far more than the United States has said in public so far. Well, let's go live now to Washington, D.C., and to Doug Parle, who's Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He was also on the National Security Council staffs of President Reagan and George H.W. Bush between 1986 and 1993. I think you were Director of Asian Affairs. Weren't you? Very good to talk to you. First of all, what do you make of that claim, this claim, particular claim, from Pyongyang? Well, I, I'm surprised to hear it on your news program because uh, nothing came from the American side about that. But I'm not surprised that the North came away with a number of messages that may not be in the publicly released material so far. Uh, they will have construed or heard things that uh, are not, that the American government is not ready to tell the American people directly. Uh, this, uh, President Trump's pledge at the press conference to stop the military exercises will exacerbate, surely, the nervousness in South Korea and in Japan. Of course. Um, and, and you take that together with Trump's performance at the G7 meeting in Quebec and his extraordinary press conference after the summit, and you see a person who's trying to pull apart the liberal international order that was put together by the United States and its partners in the aftermath of World War II. He is taking on some very big risks, but the first step toward reducing the tensions on the Korean Peninsula is a much weaker, shorter step than at least I had anticipated. And yet we're hearing that Mike Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State, is coming onto the peninsula again. Uh, there is bound to be a great deal, isn't there, to be finessed, perhaps to be changed entirely from what was discussed or at least claimed at the summit. Well, I, I think that's right. And certainly the South Koreans and not mentioned so far the Japanese are going to be shocked that the U.S. would give up its conventional military exercises in exchange for nothing from North Korea, uh, which is presenting a non-conventional nuclear, chemical, biological threat to the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. Uh, those exercises are vital to maintaining the ability to det uh, deter conflict from starting from North Korea. The American troops and the South Korean troops are draftees in the Korean case, short-term servers in the American case. The North Koreans, their forces are there a long time. We need to exercise every year to be ready for conflict. And to give that up is, an, is a major concession, and we don't see anything in return.
Doug Paul at the Carnegie Endowment. Very good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, the potential implications of the summit are widespread, not least in the Korean Peninsula, where North and South have been divided, of course, since the end of the Second World War. Our sole correspondent, Laura Bicker, looks now at the meeting's possible impact. Her report does contain flashing images from the very start. It was a stunning moment for South Koreans in Singapore. They told me their hearts were racing as they watched. No! Full of hope, but also relief that these two leaders are talking instead of declaring war. Chen Am Suk could wait to phone her mum, who was born in Pyongyang. After seeing this, I suddenly thought how I wanted to go back to North Korea before I die, she says. Mum, I want your dream to come true. I want you to step back on North Korean land. In Seoul, President Moon Jae-in admitted he'd had a sleepless night, but looked jubilant at the meeting, which was partly the result of his careful diplomacy. But Donald Trump had a surprise for him. He pledged to end what he described as war games, joint military exercises between South Korea and the US. They've always angered the North. This will worry neighboring Japan, as will Mr. Trump's suggestion to remove troops from the peninsula in the future. It's a mistake to cancel all joint US-South Korea military exercises. Uh, the United States needs to maintain sufficient uh, level of readiness and preparedness on the peninsula because the North Korean nuclear threat is still there. That's why many will find today's announcement disappointing. Kim Jong-un is now leaving the island of Sentosa, having gained the summit and the status he's longed for. He says the world will change. The problem is we're not sure what that change may mean. Now that the missile launches have stopped, China appears eager to ease back on the toughest economic sanctions it has ever imposed on its neighbour. Today, North Korea took its first tentative steps out of the shadows. How far it's prepared to go remains uncertain. Laura Bicker, BBC News, Singapore. More on this to come in just a moment, but let's just bring you that news that broke just in the past few minutes. North Korea is claiming that President Trump agreed to lift sanctions on the North during the summit meeting on Tuesday morning. That's on the front page of the Workers' Daily, the mouthpiece of North Korea's ruling Communist Party. The paper says President Trump agreed to lift sanctions, something that clearly was not in the signed agreement and not mentioned by anyone from the U.S. leadership so far in public. Let's go live to Singapore. We can speak now to Francesco Mancini, Associate Dean and Visiting Associate Professor at the National University of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. First of all, your reaction to that news just breaking that North Korea is claiming the sa that President Trump has promised to get the sanctions lifted. This on top of the news that both leaders plan to visit each other's capitals and that military exercises by the South and the U.S. will apparently be suspended. Yes, I mean, I'm not surprised that it's going to be a bit of a confusion about the content of, of the meetings. Um, uh, again, I think everybody will play uh, the news uh, on their advantage. Uh, this is the result of having a rather murky uh, process. Uh, history has, has told us that very personal summits are not very successful precisely because there's not a clear record of what actually happened. So it doesn't surprise me, uh, but it just adds to the overall confusion, which obviously it doesn't work very well in this part of the world. Our World Affairs editor was saying today, it looks as though Mr. Trump got thoroughly done over in the English phrase in Singapore. He agreed to cancel the exercises as North Korea had been demanding, as China clearly wanted. But Kim Jong-un has not agreed to halt testing permanently, has he? Nor to let inspectors back in, nor to destroy his ICBMs, or to give details 
of its nuclear program. And as you know, what, a dozen times before, North Korea has said either it wouldn't pursue nukes or would denuclearize and hasn't done any of those things. Correct. Um, I, I think, you know, overall the reaction to the summit is positive because everybody is happy that we move from the rhetoric uh, uh, very uh, kind of escalatory uh, position of six months ago to where we are today. However, when we start to get into the details, uh, you're going to see a lot of concerns. Um, Nobody is going to be very happy of a very quick disengagement of the United States in this part of the world, uh, particularly Japan, um, as well as South Korea, but also countries in Southeast Asia who really count on the United States as a counterbalance to the growing uh, Chinese military engagement in this part of the world. Uh, China is obviously happy. Uh, that's the ultimate goal of China, is to see uh, the U.S. troops out of the Korean Peninsula. Um, so it's, it, that's where we are. And, and I think that obviously Kim got the most out of these 24 hours here in Singapore. Yeah, there's big questions, aren't there? Security of Northeast Asia at stake, no less. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks to you for being with us. Stay with us if you can on BBC News. Much more to come, including this. Caught on camera, what the leader's body language revealed about what they were thinking. Very good to have you with us on BBC News, the latest headlines. North Korean state media is saying that Kim Jong-un has accepted an invitation to visit the United States and Donald Trump's been invited to Pyongyang. The U.S. president has described Tuesday's summit in Singapore as tremendous. North Korea's leaders again have pledged to get rid of his nuclear weapons, but North Korean state media is also claiming that the U.S. has agreed to lift sanctions, something that has not been said by any of the American leadership so far. Well, the British government has averted for now a damaging defeat for its Brexit, its Brexit strategy. A mix of last-minute promises and negotiations persuaded a majority of 26 members of parliament to reject an amendment to the EU withdrawal bill. That amendment from the unelected upper chamber, the Lords, would have given parliament wide powers over the Brexit process. Here's our political editor, Laura Kunzberg. The eyes to the right, 324. The nose to the left, 298. They got there, but it wasn't pretty. Should Parliament get more power over Brexit if the final deal is sunk? 324! Only in the last 10 minutes, the promise of a compromise on that seemed to keep both sides of the restive Tory party on board. The government has realised that it must have an amendment, a further amendment to the bill, which deals with Parliament's role in the event of there being no deal. Getting some unity and inevitably having some degree of give and take is part of the process. Remainers have been pushing and pushing to give MPs more say if it all goes wrong. But the government for hours had been resisting giving Parliament more power if the Brexit deal is sunk. Have you told the Prime Minister while you're resigning, sir? I will be issuing a statement shortly. It started badly with a government minister quitting so he could make the case for giving Parliament more control over Brexit too. I urge my parliamentary colleagues to follow my lead and vote to give our great institution, this House of Commons, our constituents and our country the powers it needs to leave our children a legacy of which we can all be proud. At that point, ministers thought they were safe and wouldn't have to budge. They want to reverse the result of the referendum. And nothing we do will be organised to allow a reversal of the result of the referendum. None of their Lordship's amendments in any way seek to frustrate the Brexit process or allow, or allow, or allow, this, house, or allow this House to overturn the referendum result. And watch. A government defeat was close, very, very close. The man sidling up the steps on the left of your screen is the government's chief whip. He's the man whose job it is to prevent the government from being beaten. He sits for a casual chat with some possible rebels, a promise that the government would budge. The three behind the MP standing discuss what to do, stick or twist. Then look, the chief whip in action again, creeping along the front bench. Was he delivering the news of how a deal could be done? But just what exactly has been agreed? 
Remember, rebels did not vote against the government because they believed they had a personal promise from the Prime Minister that there would be a change to the draft laws. Well, what we've agreed to is further discussions with Dominic Grieve and other concerned parties about the way in which we can potentially make a further step forward on the important amendment that we made today. In your mind, all the government has agreed is to have further discussions to try to find a way through. And there's a purpose to those discussions, which is a potential amendment, further amendment in the Lords. The Remainers, who piled into the Prime Minister's office, believed that they had an assurance from her that they could trust that this wouldn't just be a discussion, this will be a change. There's an expectation that a discussion will yield some fruit, and I'm not saying it won't, uh, and it could we very well end up with a further amendment in the Lords. Those are not the same thing, and then there's, issue, there's an issue of trust here. I'm not going to just blithely come forward with a set of ideas that haven't uh, had the merit of consultation or scrutiny with colleagues. It's got to be done properly. But if inside their party, inside that building, there are very different versions of events. What are the rest of us meant to make of it? Brexit was never going to be easy, but there are plenty who fear by trying to run away from confrontation, the government is making it harder than it really needs to be. Laura Kunzberg with that report. France and Italy have exchanged sharp words over hundreds of migrants on a ship in the Mediterranean. The French president accused the new Italian government of cynicism and irresponsibility for refusing to let them land in Italy. Around 600 people rescued last weekend have now received vital food supplies. The group, including pregnant women and children as well, mainly from West Africa. Our correspondent James Reynolds sent this update from a Sicilian port of Catania. The ship leaves in its wake a series of damaged relationships in Europe. Spain says pointedly that democracies must obey their international obligations. And France has called the apparent policy of stopping NGO ships here cynical and irresponsible. The Italian populist government doesn't really worry about those criticisms. And if you look closely at its policy, you'll find this. There's still a way for rescued migrants to reach these shores. The Italian Coast Guard continues to play a leading role in the search and rescue of migrants in the Mediterranean. And in the morning, in this port, we expect the Coast Guard to drop off around 900 migrants that it has rescued. So it seems that Italy remains open so long as you are brought here under an Italian flag. James Reynolds there with that update. Let's take you back to our main story, the Singapore summit. The day itself, of course, not short of dramatic images, most notably President Trump and Kim Jong-un shaking hands on a red carpet with the North Korean and U.S. flags together as a backdrop. But what did we learn from their body language? Trump is clearly making an effort to dial it back. No matter what, we have seen that there are moments of fleeting rapport that the two leaders face. During the 13-second handshake, I could see Kim Jong-un actually having a very relaxed jaw. His mouth was open and he was looking at Trump from head to toe. I could see his eyes going. It's almost like he couldn't believe that this moment that he's been waiting for, where he gets to meet the leader of the free world, it's happening right now. There is also, I mean, in terms of the Asian context, a particular deference when you meet with somebody older. So he's letting Trump take the lead and he's taking Trump in. Their handshake was well balanced, no big grabs, certainly none of the macho pull that we've seen before. This was much more welcoming, subdued. Trump looks very comfortable. He shows off his signature. He passes the book to Kim. He reaches out first to shake his hand, gives him a little bit of a pat. Let's just quickly update you on that news with America's allies in Northeast Asia, South Korea and 
Japan still digesting that assertion from President Trump that military exercises will be suspended on the Korean Peninsula. That news coming in from South Korean state media. There's claims in South Korean state media that uh, the U.S. agreed, President Trump agreed to lift sanctions on North Korea during the summit. That's certainly not been said in public. Uh, also, the two leaders, we're told, plan to visit each other's capitals. More to come.